I'm going to eventually run out of these uh, opening intros and hopefully I don't get in a lot of trouble for using the music. But hello everybody and welcome to yet another of my YouTube lectures. We're in period 5, 1844-1877. We're going to be looking at basically the 1850s here and the collapse of compromise. And what we mean by that is uh, the subject of slavery. Uh, up until now, the federal government has seemed content to compromise over this issue between the North and the South, always placating to the Southern uh, ideology and sympathies when it comes to their peculiar institution. But there's going to come a moment, obviously, where they can't compromise anymore. But we can't just say, bam, Civil War. Something has got to happen in between the compromising and the Civil War. And that's the decade of the 1850s. So we're going to take a look at that and see how that unfolds. Uh, now, I will tell you, we are going to take a little time with this because I want to make sure that we are fully aware of what it is that we're talking about when we talk about this particular decade. So let's do it through the key concepts. 5.2, Roman numeral 1. So 5.2 tells me Right up, 5.2. If you have your key concepts, you'll see it's right there. It's intensified by expansion and deepening regional divisions. These debates over slavery and economic, cultural, political issues led the nation into the Civil War. Remember, we're talking about contextualization in class a lot. And those of you who are perhaps watching from an, another class or a school or a state, Contextualization is your point that you get in essay writing, both in the DBQ and the LEQ. You want to be able to put a specific historical event into a broader historical context, contextualizing it. So you, the, the College Board kind of gives you a heads up on how to do that in the key concepts. Now, of course, this writing this verbatim wouldn't get you the, the contextualization point, but you can take this and expound upon it, right? This growing expansion that's happening, this westward migration, a fulfilling of manifest destiny is beginning to deepening these regional divisions between North and South, especially as their desire to decide how the West will look. It brought back debates on slavery. It brought up debates on economic and cultural differences and obviously various political issues between the two. Right? So something like that is more contextualizing. Then you can get it into a very specific thing on, let's, on this issue, the collapse of compromise. Roman numeral one also kind of takes this contextualization and narrows it a little bit more for us. Ideological and economic differences over slavery. We get a, a wide array of diverging responses uh, between the two political parties, between various... Uh, individuals. We're going to talk about some individual players, uh, both abolitionists and those who support slavery, and how all this will come to this point in period five. We'll get to this thing called the Civil War. But the collapse of compromise, you can pretty much put it in this decade, this antebellum decade or before war decade. Staying in the key concepts, here we see in letter A, where now we get a very defined situation that we're talking about. One of the big points, the North is expanding in its manufacturing, right? They have this industry has emerged. Textiles, started with textiles, but now an iron industry, a meat packing industry, a clothing industry, a shipping industry, lumber industries. All of this is growing in the North. And what kind of labor does the North use? When we say free labor, remember, this is an economic expression. It doesn't mean people are working for free. It means these are individuals who freely decide where they would like to work for a wage. These are wage earners, but no one is forcing them to work at this factory or that factory. They get to choose. Um, we call this you know, a, a, a contract situation, free contract. You're allowed to go in and decide... Do I want to work here? Do I want to work there? That's what the North is developing. While, as we know, the Southern economy, which is not industrialized, is still this agricultural 
uh, experiment with cotton as its key element for its economy is still completely dependent upon slave labor. Right? So there it is right there in your concept on slave labor. So you have this growing animosity in some respects and differences of everything you can imagine growing between these two parts of this country. That's why a lot of people look at it and they, they think there's really two different countries here in North America. Not, not well, discounting Canada and Mexico, but within the United States. A northern United States and a southern United States. And slavery is the underlining causes of this, but it, it affects their culture, it affects their, uh, their economics, socially, how they think, how they interact with each other. All this is extremely important to take note of. Uh, Northerners, as it tells you here in the concept, don't necessarily are objecting to slavery on principle just yet. They're not all running out to become an abolitionist. But again, the free market situation is starting to have them start to think about competition. Right? We talked about this before, we talked about the Mexican War, why some of the Northerners opposed uh, it as a slave war, but also as a free market war. Right, the Wilmot Proviso, right, that add-on to the war appropriation bill, the Mexican War. David Wilmot, not an abolitionist, but he's thinking of this free soil movement, that the lands in Mexico, what if the South did decide to industrialize? Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California could be good places to start industry. The South would have a very cheap labor source because they would have slaves. So some are starting to, to want to stop the spread of slavery because of economic reasons. Not really moral yet. Eventually it's going to develop into that, but we do know there are those abolitionists who are out there who are going to fight for this on a moral ground. But the decade of the 1850s is a very, very delicate decade. Some are still wondering if we can compromise on this issue and not go to war while others are starting to totally understand that war is perhaps inevitable. If we move on into letter B, here are the abolitionists. Now they tell us they're a minority group, which they were, but they become a highly vocal minority group. And it tells us there are three things that their campaign is based upon. They're going to present moral arguments, obviously against. This is a moral wrong. Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, two of the biggest leading voices of abolition. William Garrison is like the grandfather of this movement. In fact, he was the mentor to Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass will write one of the greatest speeches of the time period, which we're going to do in, one, in our a Great American Speech Project and talk a little bit about it in class, is the, uh, the meeting of the 4th of July, right, 1852. This great argument as to why are we celebrating a, a holiday about independence, right? About independence, about freedom. And yet, there are millions of individuals in bondage. To an African American of the time period, what would the Declaration of Independence, what would the 4th of July really mean to them is his argument. And he gave that speech in the North. He gave that speech to a predominantly white audience, which is pretty historical at the time period. And it's going to start getting people thinking, right? They, they use these moral arguments now that are going to start being presented. And more and more, especially younger white individ, uh, men and women, are going to start to pick up the abolitionist cause because of this. We also know, second point, assisting slaves to escape. I think this goes without saying, many of us since elementary school have been learning about the Underground Railroad. You probably know a lot about Harriet Tubman, but there are many individuals who worked uh, that uh, Underground Railroad system, helping individuals to escape from the South into parts into Ohio, and then from Ohio sometimes into Canada right, to get their freedom. And then here, point three, sometimes there's even a willingness to use violence. In the 1830s, you had the famous Nat Turner Rebellion, uh, a slave who tried to start a slave 
revolution. Um, dozens and dozens of white families will be murdered. Um, but again, slavery is a terrible thing. And sometimes the only way to get rid of something that terrible is going to be through bloodshed, as the Civil War will eventually prove. But things are starting to get very hostile now in the 1850s because of this. Letter C tells us there are defenders of slavery, obviously, in the South. They have their racial doctrines we've talked about in the, our book, America's History, talks about hair and vogue philosophy, a German word, right? That means basically master race, the superior of a race. Uh, the concept tells you they defend it as a positive social good. This becomes known as the Southern apologist theory. Now, the word apologist, we think of apology, but we think today in terms of, oh, I'm sorry. But back in the day, an apology could actually also mean, let me explain to you why I do what I do. And maybe in explaining my apologist theory, you'll come to understand why I'm doing it. It's, more, it's not really saying I'm sorry. It's an explanation. And their explanation is, we brought civilization to African Americans. We gave them a place to live. We've clothed them, we fed them, we treat them like family. Remember we talked about this in class? This perverse sense of familiar love is what they start to argue about. And without us, they would be lost. And they're gonna hold on to that. We're gonna talk about after the Civil War, how individuals will begin to basically rewrite history using these Southern apologist theory thoughts. They begin to say, hey, don't forget, this is protected by the Constitution. Right? It's in the Constitution. The three-fifths compromise is there. Uh, the fugitive slave law is there. Although they don't use the word slaves, it is there in the Constitution. And we're going to talk about something here very specifically in this video where a Supreme Court case will also use the Fifth Amendment to protect slavery. Think about compact theory. And we might say, well, this has nothing to do with slavery. Well, well, think again. Southerners are holding on to this idea that if the states created the government, or the government, and the states are superior, they can nullify any law that the federal government passed that they don't like. So this would also lead them to thinking, if you start doing things like that Wilmot Proviso, and you try your best to pass that law, we'll nullify it. And remember, Calhoun with his South Carolina exposition in the 1830s, talked about secession. So this is growing in the South, the idea that if the North keeps pressing to do something about slavery, either stop it from spreading West or try to get rid of it altogether or allow more and more abolitionist thinking, it's time to start nullifying. It might be actually time to start thinking a secession and leaving the Union altogether. All of this is coming to a head in the 1850s. Here in 5.2, now Roman numeral 2. So again, we've got a contextualization point that we still have from the first slide there in 5.2. And we had that with Roman numeral 1 to, to kind of narrow it a little bit. But now we can also do this with Roman numeral 2 here. Debates over slavery came to dominate the political discussion of the 1850s. If you remember in the 1840s, they tried to avoid it. They try to avoid those discussions. Uh, in the election of 1840, there was no discussion of slavery. Right? That was all law cabins and hard cider. Now it's becoming more and more because the South and the North are really starting to push at each other. The Democratic Party has the biggest problem because they're a national party. Northern Democrats are going to defend slavery in order to keep their Southern brethren happy. This is going to lead to some very, very terrible presidents of the 1850s. Eventually, this comes to a head with the election of 1860. That's when Abraham Lincoln becomes president of the United States. See, up until now, various compromises. Now, the Northwest Ordinance is not a compromise, but think about that. Before they wrote the Constitution, under the Articles, they did pass a law, the first law to outlaw slavery in the old Northwest. The North has been building on this idea. 
as territories come in, the Northwest Ordinance also describes how a territory becomes a state. Why not bring this to parts of the West? We've compromised with three-fifths for them so they can count slaves in the South and add more electoral votes and more members of the House. They compromise in the Louisiana Territory with the Missouri Compromise. Now people are, the Democratic Party is talking about popular sovereignty, remember? Don't get rid of the Missouri Compromise. Why do we even worry about that? Let people in the territory vote. Well, some are beginning to wonder, well, we already have a Northwest Ordinance. Why not extend the idea of no slavery it was in the Northwest, why not extend that part of that law to the territories? So a collision course is coming. A collision course is coming now in the 1850s. Letter A, we've already talked about the Mexican War. Again, the Wilmot Proviso. Obviously, this is a pretty important thing that I keep bringing up to you. This is something that, in, that will stay with the South after the war. They begin to realize the North is not going to compromise anymore. The North, either for economic or for moral reasons, they don't want slavery to go west. This is a problem. And then letter B tells us where it all comes to an end. The Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and here's the Supreme Court case, the Dred Scott decision. All of these ultimately fail to reduce this conflict. They're trying to resolve slavery, but they can't. Well, what is the Compromise of 1850? What is the Kansas-Nebraska Act? And what is the Dred Scott decision? Well, let's go into these now very specifically. Let's look at the Compromise of 1850. If you remember, 1848 election, James K. Polk decides not to run for re-election. Zachary Taylor, a Whig, the general, the famous general of the Mexican War, old rough and ready, the hero of Buenos, uh, Buena Vista, I believe. I think I may be wrong on that. Don't quote me on that one. I, I, I got a blank here now. Um, well, anyways, he's president now. By all likelihood, he should have had a very easy time in office. Both the North and the South 1848 going to 1849, don't really seem like they want to fight over slavery so much. But then California, which is a territory, gold is discovered outside of San Francisco at Sutter's Mill in 1849. If you know anything about the National Football League, you might know there's a football team in San Francisco called the 49ers. Because this is when the great gold rush happens in 1849. Thousands and thousands start flooding to California, panhandling, you know, looking for gold in the rivers and the streams, digging for gold, prospecting. But these weren't the nicest of people. These were, these were very bad people in a lot of respects. Um, California has a criminal problem, a, a, a lawless problem, and they need federal protection, but they're a territory. So they decide to go the route of Texas. Texas entered in as a state. So they decide, hey, we've got enough population here. We need federal protection. Let's enter in as a state. But they want to enter in as a free state. And this drives the South crazy. They want to divide California. Northern California free, Southern California slavery. But California says under no circumstances will they divide their state nor will they be a slave state. The Civil War could have started right now in 1850. Enter Henry Clay. His last moment in the sun. Henry Clay is quite old at this time. He's still in the Senate. And he comes up with what comes to be known as the Compromise of 1850. Now, I'm not going to go into, I'm going to try not to spend too much time because the books and your concepts don't get into it in detail, but it's, it's what we call an omnibus, which means it's, he, he proposed it as an all or nothing bill. Omnibus means all or nothing. There are actually eight parts to this, but most textbooks only tell you like three or four because they only focus on the main things. And it's mostly in what we call quid pro quo. 
Quid pro quo means this for that. For instance, the first thing he says, California enters in as a free state. But in order to get this, in order to get, I'm sorry, in order to get that, I've got to give up this. So the second part would be the rest of the territories get to decide by popular sovereignty. So you get California as a free state, the rest of the territories decide by popular sovereignty. The one that most textbooks don't talk about is that if you remember on my map, you see how massive Texas is. Well, Texas is going to war with, a, with the territory of New Mexico over boundary disputes, like literally getting ready to go to war with them. So part of this is the boundary dispute, uh, dispute goes into favor of New Mexico, but Texas will get $10 million because they're in debt. That's a little side thing. Uh, five and six is a big one to Henry Clay. Uh, he no longer wants slave auctions in Washington, D.C. Remember, even though he's a slave owner, he does believe that slavery has to come to an end. He believes in manumission, right? The gradual emancipation of slaves. But the thing he hated the most were slave auctions, putting human beings on stages and putting them up for sale for the whole world to see. And one of the largest slave auctions was in the nation's capital. He found that disgusting. He said, no more slave auctions in Washington, D.C. But in order to get that, he had to give something up. Well, you can still own slaves in Washington, D.C. Right? You can't tell the South you can't own slaves in Washington, D.C. because that is a Southern capital, right? Washington, D.C. is in Virginia. No more slave auctions. No more buying and selling of slaves, but you can still own them. He also adds a stricter fugitive slave law uh, to this. And uh, so every little thing. Oh, and the last part was that Congress will no longer be able to regulate the slave trade. So it was those eight parts. But everybody had something that they hated or loved about this omnibus, all or nothing, eight part bill. This is, he proposes this in January, but he's very sick. He's going to go home to Kentucky, and he's never going to come back to Washington, D.C. He will live two more years, but in 1852, Henry Clay finally passes away. Right? The, the great uh, compromiser, right? the great pacifier, as he was known as, uh, the great statesman, the man who ran for president three times will finally pass away. This is the last time we will talk about Henry Clay as having a role in government. Starting in February and lasting through March, now come all of the debate that's going to happen over this compromise in the Senate. Speeches after speeches are going to be given. The first speech is by the werewolf himself, John C. Calhoun. Look at that neck beard. Look at the neck. That man is a werewolf. He is a werewolf. He's, he is very, very sick. He's dying of tuberculosis. He's trying to give a speech, but he can't stop coughing. He's coughing so bad they have to take him out of the Senate. As he's leaving, supposedly the last words he will say in the Senate, the South, the South. God knows what will become of her. They take him across the street to a hotel, and within a day, he dies. John C. Calhoun becomes the first of these great senators that came at the War of 1812 who passes away. And somebody else gives his speech. But the speech was all about secession and Southern pride and everything about the South. The most famous of speeches is actually by Daniel Webster. It's known as the 7th of March speech because it was given on the 7th of March. And that's one of the speeches we're going to be doing in our Great American uh, Speech Project. Uh, he fights hard for compromise. He believes in the compromise that Clay comes up with, and he gives one of the most powerful speeches ever given in the chambers of the Senate but he's actually trying to plead with northern senators to compromise. 
And again, that's one of those ones we're going to look at a little bit more closely in class. One of the newer senators, William Seward, is a devout abolitionist. He will give what's called the higher law speech, that he must answer to a higher law than the Constitution, and that, of course, is the Bible. And he begins to argue that slavery is, an, is a moral wrong principle that must come to an end. In the end, there was not a lot that everybody loved about the speech. A lot of people thought that it would never pass because there's eight parts to it and there's something that, nope, that there's at least one thing that everybody hates. I don't know if you actually could hear that sound effect or not. Uh, Zachary Taylor winds up dying as President of the United States. He, uh, July 4th, 1850, He's outside celebrating uh, parades and fireworks. He's drinking uh, lemonade and eating uh, cold cherries. More than likely, he got a bad case of cholera, and he winds up dying within a few days. And now the vice president, uh, William uh, Millard Fillmore. <laughs> Millard Fillmore is now president of the United States, who was every day in the Senate listening to these speeches, and he decided that he liked that he liked this compromise. Stephen Douglas, who we're going to talk a lot about in class two, is another one of these younger senators. He's the guy that really saves this compromise by making sure that instead of an omnibus, all or nothing, that they vote on this one part at a time. This allows everyone to vote their conscience. You don't like a stricter fugitive slave law? Vote it down. Enough people will vote yes, it will pass. You don't like the fact that California comes in as a free state, vote it down, enough people will vote yes, it will pass. And that's what happens. All eight parts pass, with Zachary Taylor dead, who, by the way, would have vetoed this law because he didn't like the compromise. Millard Fillmore is now president. He signs the compromise, and this is the last compromise between the North and South. But Stephen Douglas is going to start committing political suicide now. He's become famous. He's from Illinois, like Abraham Lincoln, and he wants to be president as well. So in 1854, he comes up with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He's a Democrat, a Northern Democrat who has decided, let's let popular sovereignty rule throughout the territories. People seem to like this really well. And um, the president at the time is now Franklin Pierce one of our weakest, ridiculous presidents we've ever had. Um, and he basically threatens Pierce. Him and a couple of other guys come into his office, one of which is Jefferson Davis, who becomes the president of the Confederacy later on. And they threaten Pierce that they want him to repeal the Missouri Compromise. Are they going to make his presidentship a living hell? And he does. He does, just to get them off his back. And once they repeal the Missouri Compromise... They're able to get the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed. Let the territories decide for themselves. Douglas thinks this is a win-win situation. Nebraska is, is in more north. It's close to Iowa, which is a free state, and Illinois, a free state. It'll become a free state. Kansas is next to Missouri, which is a slave state. It'll naturally become a slave state. But the battleground is now drawn in Kansas. Thousands of abolitionist missionaries come to Kansas, Thousands of slavers come to Kansas, but they don't bring their slaves with them because this becomes a violent revolution. Uh, civil war, not a revolution, a civil war. For all intents and purposes, the civil war has begun in Kansas, and it becomes known as Bleeding Kansas. Every day reports are, give, are, are brought in to the country of people massacring each other. It is a bloodbath. Franklin Pierce cannot stop it. The election of 56 is around the corner, so the Democrats do not want to uh, re-nominate Franklin Pierce. He's a Democrat. They nominate a new Democrat, James Buchanan, and he becomes the new president, but it only gets worse now with yet another Northern Democrat. James Buchanan, uh, there is a Supreme Court case getting ready to happen. Uh, now, Supreme Court cases, so you know, 
they're not something that just happens. This takes years to get to Supreme Court. You have a slave in the name of Dred Scott. His owner was a doctor in the U.S. military, and they had moved from Missouri to Illinois, which is free territory, lived there for multiple years. Then they moved to Wisconsin, which was a territory, but it was free. When his owner died, Dred Scott ordered, or Dred Scott assumed he needs to be free man now. He lived in free territory all these years. And by the way, your textbooks don't tell you this, but Missouri actually had a law that stated if a slave owner moved to a free state and lived there for a certain amount of years, the slave had a right to claim his freedom. So using Missouri law, he claimed his freedom. But the family of the owner needed money. So they wind up selling Dred Scott. And that guy took it to court. And that started in the state courts. And the state courts actually ruled in favor of Dred Scott. But then the Supreme Court gets involved. This took several years. It got up to the Supreme Court. You may remember the name Roger Taney. He was the guy that helped Andrew Jackson destroy the Bank of the United States. And as a favor, Andrew Jackson appointed him Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. First thing he rules is that Dred Scott is not a citizen of the United States. Thereby, he should have never been allowed in a court at all. Throw the case out. Could have, could have ended it right there. But not Roger Taney. Mm -mm, no way. He looked at the Constitution. And he took a chainsaw to it. <laughs> you probably thought that was a motorcycle, but that was a chainsaw. He cuts this up, man. He takes the Fifth Amendment, which in the Fifth Amendment, it says that the federal government cannot deny you the right of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. What are slaves but property? He orders that because slaves are property, the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional to begin with. There is no such thing as a free state in the, United, in the United States at all. No more free states. The Supreme Court rules this. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. That was me ranting and I censored it. All right, this is terrible. This is terrible. Uh, the North freaks the freak out over this ruling. And Buchanan goes down in history as the worst president ever. Because not only can he not stop the Civil War, he hastens the Civil War. Because he commits an act of treason here. Originally, you have five Southern judges, four Northern judges. So it was a five to four vote along, you know, Divided lines, the North versus the South. The, the judge that was from Pennsylvania, a northern state, which is where Buchanan is, he ordered that judge to change his vote so it would be a six to three vote so that no one could argue this was a North versus South. This has to be a constitutional issue. You can't do that. You cannot do that. That, that is wrong. President of the United States cannot do that. I cannot emphasize that enough. Buchanan did it. Then in Kansas, because they're killing everybody, two different con state constitutions get written very quickly. Uh, a Topeka uh, constitution, which was surprise, surprise, with no slaves, because that was written by the abolitionists. But the Lecompton constitution, Lecompton, Kansas, is written. And that one is, yes, for slaves. That's the one that James Buchanan accepts that Kansas has to be a slave state. He's doing everything he can to bring about the actual Civil War. This case, this Dred Scott decision, is going to make Abraham Lincoln get back into politics. He cannot take it anymore. The Whig Party is dead and gone. 
he's going to join this new Republican Party. In 1858, he's going to try and take on Stephen Douglas for U.S. Senator. And we're going to have the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. We're going to talk about that in class. He's, he will lose, but his name is starting to get out there. Lincoln, Lincoln is a guy who begins to realize something has to be done here. The country is going crazy, and it has to stop. All right, for further reading on this that I've talked about in our book, America's History, pages 412 to 422. Now, it sounds like a lot of pages, but remember, there's a lot of pictures in that book. But I do want you to answer three questions. Number two on page 417, and numbers one and two on page 422. All right, good night, good luck. See everybody whenever it is. I'll see you again. Bye-bye.